Okay, to kick off this quarter, we're going to review some of the key concepts we covered last quarter. But I'll move through it a little bit quicker, obviously, because I'm going to try to fit this all in one video. So we'll start with divining functions. So if I have a function f, this notation is saying that I'm going to send an input x to an output y. So if I say f of 2 equals 9, then this is a some kind of math rule that's taking an input 2 and there's math operations that happen to it. And then after those operations happen, we send that 2 to an output of 9. Okay, so as an example, we could say that our input x, what we're going to do to it is we're going to square it. So f of x equals x squared. So then if I say f of 2, then that's going to be 2 squared, which is 4. So my function f, which is just x squared, sends my input 2 to the output 4 through an operation of squaring. As another example, if I have g of x equals 5 times x minus 2, then if I say g of 3, that's going to be 5 times 3 minus 2, which is 15 minus 2, which is 13. So I'm taking my input 3 and I'm sending it to an output of 13, and how I'm doing that is I'm multiplying by 5 and then I'm subtracting 2. Okay, so there, those are our functions. They send an input to an output. So then we talked about function transformations. So if I have uh, my x squared function, oh yeah, sorry, let's talk about graphs really quick. So if I have my function x squared, I can make like a table of my inputs and outputs. And if x is 0, then y is 0. If x is 1, 1 squared is 1. If x is 2, 2 squared is 4. Okay, negative 2, negative 2 squared is also 4. Negative 1 squared is also 1. I can see these inputs and outputs, and I can see that they're making these coordinate points. But then so a man-made way of representing this is to make a two-dimensional axis, like a two-dimensional plane, and then to make sure that the horizontal piece represents our x values and the vertical piece represents our y values. So we have a point at 0, 0, and then we have a point at 1, 1, and also negative 1, 1, and then we have a point at 2, 1. 4 because there's an x of 2 and a y of 4 and then negative 2 comma 4 as well and then we can connect all of our points together using a line and this is a visual representation of the function x squared on the horizontal axis we have the inputs and then if we hit the horizontal axis and then go up until we hit the the curve that's going to tell us uh, what the vertical uh, axis point is and so we end up with all these coordinate points that uh, sketch this function so then we reviewed this idea of transforming functions. So we have this graph over here, but we could take x squared and we could subtract 5, right? And then we could add, let's say add 2, and then we could also multiply out front by 3. So uh, in, in the second quarter, what we reviewed is what each of, what's happening to each of these, uh, what's happening to the function as we apply each of these operations. So... What we have with this x minus 5 is this is replacing our input, right? So let's say that we had an input of 2 in our normal function, which we know 2 squared goes to 4, right? We're replacing that with an input of x minus 5. So what's our new x value? Well, if we do some algebra here, we get that x equals 7. So x was, our input was 2, right? But then when we replace our input with x minus 5, we now get that that input 2 has moved to an input of 7. So we've shifted 5 to the right in the x direction. So 5 horizontally means that we're moving 5 units to the right. Okay. Now this is on the outside. This is going to add to our outputs. And this is going to make our outputs bigger by 2. So this is going to shift 2 up. This is a vertical shift. And then over here... We're going to multiply all of our inputs by 3. Okay, so 3 times steeper, sorry, outputs, because we are multiplying our vertical points by 3, which makes our overall graph 3 times steeper. So then if we go back to this table now and apply these operations, okay, so first of all, we're going to... Uh, we're going to add 5 to all of our x values because we've shifted 5 to the right from that vertical shift. So now this is going to become 5... 6, this is 7, this is 3, and this is 4, okay? And then all of our outputs, what are we doing? First, we're, order of operations, we're multiplying by 3 first, and then we're adding 2. So multiplying by 3, then add 2. 
So we're going to multiply 0 by 3, which is going to give us 0, and then we're going to add 2. So that gives us 2. All right, we're going to multiply 1 by 3, which gives us 3, and then add 2, which gives us 5. So this is at 5 now. We're going to multiply 4 by uh, 3, which gives us 12, and then add 2, which gives us 14. All right, we're going to uh, get 14 here as well. And then we're going to get 5 here as well because we already did 1 up there. Okay, so we could plot these points and we give us our transformation, our transformation, our transformed graph. Okay, but there's an easier way to sketch this transformation rather than just doing this operation, these operations on the points. Okay, so let's copy our function down again. We have 3 times x minus 5 squared plus 2. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So we know that this function is going to move 5 to the right and 2 up. And so an easy way to think about this is just to take that vertex at 0, 0 and move it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to the right and 2 up, 1, 2, which takes us to 5, 2 for our vertex. And then, since we know we're getting 3 times steeper, we can see that originally we went over 1, up 1, over 1, up 1, from the vertex, but since we're three times steeper when we go over one, we're going to have to go up by three. So we're going to go over one unit and then up one, two, three. We're going to go over one unit and we're going to go up one, two, three. And then we know the general shape because we know what the original graph looks like. So then that just gives us a, a steeper parabola that has also been shifted five to the right and two up. Okay, the other thing we reviewed was polynomials and, and behavior. So we talked about the degree of a function. And then we also talked about uh, like what, what the graph might look like given the degree. So the, the degree, first of all, is the biggest exponent within the, uh, within the polynomial, right? So... These are both degree two polynomials, and we know that when we have an e a degree two, an even degree, that our end behavior is going to be either up, up if there's a positive coefficient, or it's going to be down, down if there's a negative coefficient like we have here, okay? Now, when the degree is odd like we have here, x cubed, right, if, x cu if, if the largest exponent is odd, then now the end behavior is either going to be down, up, or up, down, okay, if we have a positive odd, then it's going to be down up. And if we have a negative odd, it's going to be an up down. Okay, so then once we learned about polynomials, what we learned is that when we have real world data, which like in the real world, there's a bunch of different data points for representing, uh, rep representing some kind of real quantity. So we looked at like uh, the year, and then we looked at electronic sales, electronics sales. Right, and I'm just going to kind of put random points here. I mean, we know that in 2008 there was a big stock market crash, which caused the sales to go down. But I don't know. Let's say that they were kind of gradually going up for a while, right? And then there was a crash, and then maybe they started to level out and go up again, right? What we learned is that we can use technology to graph a like kind of like a trend polynomial of some kind that ends up following uh, the the path of the points, right? And so once we understand polynomials, we can use technology to uh, create polynomials that match real-world data so that we can make predictions about it and so that we can better model it. And we use Desmos for that, and also we use Google Sheets, and we will definitely review that process. Okay, so then we also talked about function compositions. Just going to do something really quick on this. Uh, this is when you have a situation where... Uh, you have an input and an output in a real-world situation, but then that output can also become the input of another situation. So let's say we have something like f of x equals x squared plus 5, and then we have another situation where it's like g of x equals 2x plus square root x. Okay, so we have our function f, which is sending an input to an output, and we have our function g, which is also sending an input to an output. But what we can do is we can take a function g of f of x, okay? So what's happening is the function f of x is sending x to an output, but then that output is becoming the input for the function g, and then that's going to give us a final output. So what we're going to do when we have g of f of x is we're going to take the function f of x, and we're going to plug it in 
as the input of g of x. Since it's getting plugged into g of x, that's what's happening here. It's inside, meaning it's getting plugged in. So then what this equals is we're going to have 2 times x squared plus 5 plus square root x squared plus 5. So what this does is when we plug in an x value, it's going to give us the output of f of x, and then it's going to automatically plug that output into the function g to get a new output. So f, like let's just say f sends a, input a to output b, then g is going to send that output b to a, a, a like treat it as an input and, treat, and send it to a new output c. So that's function compositions. So then we talked about derivatives, which tell us about the instantaneous rate of change or the instantaneous slope of a curve because curves have constantly changing slope. Okay, sometimes they flatten out and then get steep and then they start decreasing and flatten out again, right? And what we learned is that when you zoom in on a curve enough, it starts to look like a straight line and straight lines have slope, right? So then we learned that you can draw a tangent line and then the slope of that tangent line, which represents the instantaneous slope at a certain point, is called the derivative, okay? Or the function that tells us the slope is called the derivative. So for example, for a function f of x equals x squared, which we know looks like this, it's like a parabola, I could do a little bit better than that, okay? Well, we can use a derivative to determine the instantaneous slope at all these different points, okay? So what we learned is we learned this thing called the power rule where we can multiply the coefficient of the function by the exponent and we'll call the derivative f prime x. This is the derivative. Okay, we multiply the coefficient by the exponent, which is 2 in this case, and then we subtract 1 from the exponent. So our final derivative is 2x. So then we can figure out, for example, that the slope of the function at x equals 3 is 6. Okay, this is the slope of x squared at x equals 3. Okay, so then at x equals 1, 2, 3, if we zoom in, okay, we can figure out that this slope must be x equals, or sorry, the slope must be 6 at that x equals 3. Okay, for another example of the power rule, f of x equals x cubed plus 3x squared Okay, if I want to find f prime x for each of these pieces, I'm going to take the derivative by multiplying the co let's make this 2x cubed actually. Never mind, we'll keep, leave it as x cubed. So we're going to take the coefficient and multiply it by the exponent. So 3 times 1, okay, and then we're going to drop the exponent by 1, 3x squared. Plus the derivative of 3x squared, we're going to do 2 times 3, which is 6 times x to the first. So this is our final derivative. So then the derivative talks to us about the instantaneous slope of a curve, right? It tells us how steep the curve is, okay, f prime tells us steepness and direction. And when I say direction, I mean is the, is the curve increasing or decreasing? So we can see that this function, for example, right here is decreasing, so we would say that f prime is negative. But then right here, the function is increasing, so we would say f prime is positive, okay? The function is also increasing right here, so we would say f prime is positive. Okay, but one sec. Uh, what was I trying to do? I'm trying to make this axis here. So we can draw another curve. Okay, but there's also something about curves, and it has to do with their steepness, okay? When they're decreasing, increasing, we also have something called concavity, which kind of talks about how the function is curved. So if it's concave up, it looks like this. And if it's concave down, it looks like that. Okay, it's like curved down versus curved up. So you can see along this curve, there's places where it's concave up, then concave down, concave up, concave down. So it turns out that f double prime, the second derivative, tells us about concavity. Okay, so when f double prime is positive, the function is concave up, which like, I think that's like right here maybe. Okay, f double prime is positive. And then right here, f double prime is negative because we're concave down. 
Okay, I'll do another color for this next part. Okay, right, like right, roughly right there. F double prime is positive because we're concave up again, right? So that second derivative is going to tell you about concavity. Okay, last thing we'll cover because this is already a long video is our tangent lines. So if I have a curve and I want to write the equation of the tangent line at a certain point, right? Let's call this x equals a and we'll say the y value is b. Okay, so a comma b. Well, then I have to use the uh, point slope form of a line, which is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Okay, so my x value is just wherever the point is at the x value, which is a in this case. And then my y value, y1, is just whatever the y value is at the point, which is b in this case. And then m is determined by the derivative. So if this is a function f of x, the slope is going to be determined by f prime, whatever the x value is. In this case, it's a. So our slope m is f prime a. So as an example, if I wanted to figure out the slope of the tangent line of y equals x squared at x equals 3, well then I need to plug into y minus y1 equals m times x minus, my x1 is 3, okay? What's my y1? Well, y equals x squared, so my y1 better be 3 squared, which is 9. So I have y minus 9 equals m times x minus 3. And then what's m? Well, remember m is the derivative of the function at x equals a. So I'm going to find the derivative, which is 2x, and then I'm going to plug in x equals 3, which will give us a slope of 6. So then the slope of my tangent line is 6, so I have y minus 9 equals 3 times x minus 3, or sorry, 6 times x minus 3. 6 times x minus 3. Okay, so if that was a very quick, quick, quick review of some of the stuff we did last quarter, if that felt fast or it felt like you didn't quite understand everything, that's okay. Hopefully the review Desmos activity today gave you a little bit of help and we will continue to review the most important stuff that's going to be pertinent to this quarter four material. So that's all. Make sure you submit your notes to Google Classroom and I will see you in class.